It's often said that um, a lot of First Nations knowledge has been lost. We need to speak a little bit more brutally about this. It wasn't lost, it was taken. It was smashed, it was stolen. Uh, there's, there was absolute injustice through this. But it wasn't all lost and it wasn't all stolen. You know, I know of people who, uh, who were taken, who, who lived on missions, but who spent their time secretly whispering in forbidden languages in back rooms and, and in, in paddocks and telling each other stories and maintaining these histories. And these bits of knowledge have stayed with us and they're like refugia in the landscape, like, like seeds that are waiting there to grow. And these are the things that I was exposed to early on in my work in fire management that really got me thinking in a different way about fire and questioning so much of what we were doing there. First Nations were the first scientists. We have to think that if you have a culture that can survive 65,000 years or more, you're on to something. And so if we are doing good science now, it should start converging. There shouldn't be conflicts. But my concern is that what we are talking about with science now, with fire science, uh, has some fatal flaws in it that were very apparent to me when I worked with it. And that these flaws are not science. What they are is old colonial thinking that's got a bit of lipstick on it. Where we're trying to dress up this old knowledge as if this is science, as if this is something that uh, should now be a guiding principle. So when we have people who have indigenous heritage, but their, their parents, their grandparents were stolen, they had the knowledge bashed out of them in many cases. We have people trying to resurrect that knowledge and as a culture, we're offering these tools, we're offering science to say, here, try and rebuild it. But so much of that science has built into it our old colonial invasion thinking. And so we have this way now where we can look as if we're stepping back as a culture, as if we're giving over autonomy and uh, land ownership again and, and we're reconciling things. But while we're doing that as a society, there are aspects of the thinking, the core paradigms behind it all that we are passing on so that the colonisation still continues. We can't just say we're handing over land titles. We have to step back further with our thinking and we have to revisit the way we do science. And, there, and we can do that by doing better science to start with. We can also do it by listening and by thinking, what do these different ideas mean? This is a prescribed burn I conducted in my time working in fire management. And the reason for the prescribed burn was to deal with this leaf litter on the ground. And it's interesting because some of the earliest um, settlers talked about the leaf litter. And again, it came from the reason they used fire. It came from the concept of getting the litter off the ground so that we can get fresh grass and good growth for stock to eat. What has grown in more recent years though is, is this concept that somehow or other we have picked up and mimicked ancient knowledge. And this really picked up during the 19, late 50s and into the 1960s. And this is a, a quote from possibly the world's foremost fire historian, Stephen Pine. And so he's saying that we replaced fire sticks, we made it better by throwing out incendiaries from planes. He also said that we have now replaced those capsules with lasers. Now, when I did fire management, never once did I use lasers. So the thing is, Stephen Pine, who wrote this book, this is one of the books, there's a, there's a small collection of these writings from which we get a lot of our, our Australian fire myth that somehow prescribed burning is a continuation of Aboriginal burning. And I want to point out that he was talking 
to Alan MacArthur. He was able to get the information directly from him and yet somehow or other lasers got into that conversation when they don't exist in this environment. If lasers were able to enter this conversation, then how much confidence can we have that the story about Aboriginal burning is correct when he didn't have Aboriginal elders there to ask? One of the great questions for me is if we had these teams working flat out this huge industry to burn as much country as we possibly could. And yet every time there's a fire that happens, uh, we're told, uh, well, it's because we haven't done enough of this burning. We didn't do an, as much burning, as much fuel reduction as Aboriginal people did. How did Aboriginal people burn more than we do in bare feet with fire sticks, watching to see if the insects are moving faster than the flames? I mean, you think how much country you get burnt in a day. My experience of Indigenous burning and what I've been taught to celebrate as a very successful burn is a maximum, an absolute maximum of no more than 80 hectares. And that was with working with a team of all Aboriginal people who are recognised fire knowledge holders. I know what you're talking about in prescribed burning where they go out and they advertise and we're going to do a thousand hectares, 800 hectares and, all, and you're going to do it in eight hours mm. and then you're going to spend the next three days blacking it out. Um, and that is definitely the wrong way to do it. You've got to be able to walk with fire. Um, I know that when you do forest fire management you've got to you know, wear the big shiny yellow coats. Uh, you've got to have all the first aid around the, the ambulances in case someone does get burnt. You've got to have an extraction process. The way that I demonstrate burning, or cool burning as it's being termed, I've been taking my grandchildren, I started taking them out when they were eight and nine years old, burning in the bush with me. For the express reason to be able to show them that the right fire for the right country, that they can observe the insects that are moving in front of the fire or are climbing up the trees, and as soon as the fire passes underneath it, they'll come back down again watching the, um, the lizards and the snakes going down into the holes in the ground. And again, once the fire passes, they'll come back out again. Mm -hmm. So it's not about clearing land for human safety. That's a byproduct of Indigenous mm -hmm. burning. We're clearing land for everything that lives within it, yeah. all the Indigenous animals, because they are all someone's, somewhere, their totemic symbol. And under Bunjil's law, we are required to protect and preserve all totems, whether we like them or not. If Indigenous people were allowed to burn the way um, that we know, uh, without interference, and we can only get 80 hectares done in a day, it's not this one day of, of opportunity. There's multiple months throughout the year. Our burning time is right now. Mm. I was burning last week. I'll be burning on the weekend. Mm and they're not even 80 hectares, they're a couple of acres. Because that's the only area that I'm, you know, this is private people offering me my la their land, which they know is on my ancestral lands, because they have faith in the system. I've already demonstrated to them on their properties and they allow me to come back, but they don't own 80 hectares. So I've got to work to these fence lines, uh, which makes it very difficult to do. But. Uh, we have a much bigger window of opportunity to do Indigenous burning than we do prescribed burning. Uh, and Indigenous burning is not based on economics, it's not based on fuel reduction, that is a byproduct of Indigenous burning. It's not based on uh, human protection or asset protection, uh, as in a, a power station or a town. The asset is the actual bush that you're burning yourself, is what we're doing. The other asset protection is a byproduct. The asset is everything that's actually living in that forest, that's living in that wetland or living in that grassland. That's the asset that you're actually using fire to protect, not for economic benefit further down the line. Thanks. Fantastic. Thanks, Dave. How do we manage fire? Well, early uh, colonists were able to see changes in the bush as it transitioned away from Aboriginal fire use and towards colonial fire use. In the Snowies, there was the observation that the graziers there were burning the shrubs to get rid of them, to create more grazing land, but the more they burnt, the more shrubs they got back. And it just kept accelerating. Um, but that wasn't just in the Snowies. 
in southwestern Australia, and Charles Lane Poole became conservator of forests, um, and he, he noticed this in so many different places, and he, he said, all of the old people tell me this. They see this, that um, you had forests that were had no fire as long as anybody knew of, and they were beautiful open forests, and as soon as you started burning them, they thickened up and they became uh, these fire traps. And if we leave them unburnt, they can open up again. Now, a lot of people have criticised him because he studied ecology in Europe and they said, oh, he's bringing his European ideas here. What he was saying was, was not based on the, the theory of it. He was saying based off the observations of people who had seen fire change this country. Um, again, Dr Neil Burrows in the 90s looked at this for Jarrah forests and what he showed was that um, if you burn a Jarrah forest, this is years since fire, this is the, the weight of understory, um, he calls it understory fuel quantity or total biomass. Um, so the difference is that the, what he's calling fuel there is the finest parts of the plants. You take an area like this, which looks like this, that's a, a 60 years unburnt Jarrah forest, and you burn it and it will be it will be open at first, same weight of understory fuels. And remember, the understory is what drives fire, according to the Project Vesta work. Same weight of those understory fuels about a year after fire, as you've got 60 years after fire. If you leave it unburnt at a 60 year block, it'll stay open like that. If you leave it unburnt here, then five years later, it looks like this. Now, this was just a very mild fire. The farmer that owned this land here was able to put it out single-handedly. It's not that it was an intense thing that, that, that caused it all. That's just what happens with the bush there. And a couple of decades ago, Ray Specht came up with this principle that he was, he was pushing, saying basically that if you, if you have tall plants and disturbance removes the tall plants, then they're going to regrow again from the ground. You remove the overstory and you get more understory. And he showed this for a, a wide range of ecosystems across Australia. He considered this basically a universal principle across Australia. You remove the overstory, you get dense understory growth. What I want to say out of this is that we as um, colonial Australia have downgraded that knowledge and seen it as primitive. And yet when it's taken seriously, and when our science starts to catch up, when we reject the stuff that we know is wrong and instead start taking into account basic ecological principles and observable facts like the fact that flames from a burning plant are bigger than flames from the leaves on the ground, once we start accounting for reality, then our stories converge. And what we need, again, is to give the microphone to these people who are very often old, quiet people hiding out in the background who don't want the attention. But they're the people we need to hear from because these are the stories that will start to reconstruct the way we see fire in the country and give us a chance to cooperate with these old processes, put fire where it's useful, where it belongs, and allow other areas to develop and grow into these places that become less flammable. Thanks.